Chapter 9 of Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic by Thomas Higginson. Chapter 9 The Half Man. King Arthur in his youth was fond of all manly exercises, especially of wrestling, an art in which he found few equals. The old men who had been the champions of earlier days, and who still sat, in summer evenings, watching the youths who tried their skill before them, at last told him that he had no rival in Cornwall, and that his only remaining competitor elsewhere was one who had tired out all others. Where is he? said Arthur. He dwells, an old man said, on an island, whither you will have to go and find him. He is, of all wrestlers, the most formidable. You will think him, at first, so insignificant as to be hardly worth a contest. You will easily throw him at the first trial, but after a while you will find him growing stronger. He seeks out all your weak points as by magic. He never gives up. You may throw him again and again but he will conquer you at last. His name, his name, said Arthur. His name, they answered, is Hannah Din. His home is everywhere, but on his own island you will be likely to find him sooner or later. Keep clear of him, or he will get the best of you in the end, and make you his slave, as he makes slaves of others whom he has conquered. Far and wide over the ocean the young Arthur sought, he touched at island after island. He saw many weak men who did not dare to wrestle with him, and many strong ones whom he could always throw, until at last, when he was far out under the western sky, he came one day to an island which he had never before seen, and which seemed uninhabited. Presently there came out from beneath an arbor of flowers a little miniature man, graceful and quick-moving as an elf. Arthur, eager in his quest, said to him, In what island dwells Hannah Din? In this island, was the answer. Where is he? said Arthur. I am he, said the laughing boy, taking hold of his hand. What did they mean by calling you a wrestler? said Arthur. Oh, said the child, coaxingly, I am a wrestler. Try me. The king took him and tossed him in the air with his strong arms, till the boy shouted with delight. He then took Arthur by the hand and led him about the island, showed him his house and where the gardens and fields were. He showed him the rows of men toiling in the meadows or felling trees. They all work for me, he said carelessly. The king thought he had never seen a more stalwart set of labourers, then the boy led him to the house, asked him what his favourite fruits were, or his favourite beverages, and seemed to have all at hand. He was an unaccountable little creature. In size and years he seemed a child, but in his activity and agility he seemed almost a man. When the king told him so, he smiled, as winningly as ever, and said, That is what they call me, Hannah Din, the half-man. Laughing merrily, he helped Arthur into his boat and bade him farewell, urging him to come again. The king sailed away, looking back with something like affection on his winsome little playmate. It was months before Arthur came that way again. Again the merry child met him, having grown a good deal since their earlier meeting. How is my little wrestler? said Arthur. Try me, said the boy and the king tossed him again in his arms, finding the delicate limbs firmer and the slender body heavier than before, though easily manageable. The island was as green and more cultivated, there were more men working in the fields, and Arthur noticed that their look was not cheerful, but rather as of those who had been discouraged and oppressed. It was, however, a charming sail to the island, and, as it became more familiar, the king often bade his steersman guide the pinnace that way. He was often startled with the rapid growth and increased strength of the laughing boy, 
Hannah Din, while at other times he seemed much as before, and appeared to have made but little progress. The youth seemed never tired of wrestling. He always begged the king for a trial of skill, and the king rejoiced to see how readily the young wrestler caught at the tricks of the art, so that the time had long passed when even Arthur's strength could toss him lightly in the air, as at first. Hannah Din was growing with incredible rapidity into a tall young fellow, and instead of the weakness that often comes with rapid growth, his muscles grew ever harder and harder. Still merry and smiling, he began to wrestle in earnest, and one day, in a moment of carelessness, Arthur received a backfall, perhaps on moist ground, and measured his length. Rising with a quick motion, he laughed at the angry faces of his attendants and bade the boy farewell. The men at work in the fields glanced up, attracted by the sound of voices, and he saw them exchange looks with one another. Yet he felt his kingly dignity a little impaired, and hastened ere long to revisit the island and teach the saucy boy another lesson. Months had passed, and the youth had expanded into a man of princely promise, but with the same sunny look. His shoulders were now broad, his limbs of the firmest mould, his eye clear, keen, penetrating. Of all the wrestlers I have ever yet met, said the king, this younker promises to be the most formidable. I can easily throw him now, but what will he be a few years hence? The youth greeted him joyously, and they began their usual match. The sullen serfs in the fields stopped to watch them, and an aged druid priest, whom Arthur had brought with him, to give the old man air and exercise in the boat, opened his weak eyes and closed them again. As they began to wrestle, the king felt, by the very grasp of the youth's arms, by the firm set of his foot upon the turf, that this was to be unlike any previous effort. The wrestlers stood after the old Cornish fashion, breast to breast, each resting his chin on the other's shoulder. They grasped each other round the body, each setting his left hand above the other's right. Each tried to force the other to touch the ground with both shoulders and one hip, or with both hips and one shoulder, or else to compel the other to relinquish his hold for an instant either of these successes giving the victory. Often as Arthur had tried the art, he never had been so matched before. The competitors swayed this way and that, writhed, struggled, half lost their footing and regained it, yet neither yielded. All the boatmen gathered breathlessly around, King Arthur's men refusing to believe their eyes, even when they knew their king was in danger. A stranger group was that of the sullen farm labourers, who left their ploughs and spades, and, congregating on a rising ground, watched without any expression of sympathy the contest that was going on. An old wrestler from Cornwall, whom Arthur had brought with him, was the judge, and according to the habit of the time, the contest was for the best two bouts in three. By the utmost skill and strength, Arthur compelled Hannah Din to lose his hold for one instant in the first trial, and the king was pronounced the victor. The second test was far more difficult. The boy, now grown to a man, and seeming to grow older and stronger before their very eyes, twice forced Arthur to the ground, either with hip or shoulder, but never with both, while the crowd closed in breathlessly around and the half-blind old druid, who had himself been a wrestler in his youth, and who had been brought ashore to witness the contest, called warningly aloud, Save thyself, O king! At this, Arthur roused his failing strength to one final effort, and, gripping his rival round the waist with a mighty grasp, raised him bodily from the ground and threw him backward till he fell flat, like a log, on both shoulders and both hips while Arthur himself fell fainting a moment later. Nor did he recover until he found himself in the boat, his head resting on the knees of the aged druid, who said to him, Never again, O king, must you encounter the danger you have barely escaped. Had you failed, you would have become subject to your opponent, whose strength has been maturing for years to overpower you. 
had you yielded you would although a king have become but as are those dark-browed men who till his fields and do his bidding for know you not what the name hannah din means it means habit and the force of habit at first weak then growing constantly stronger ends in conquering even kings End of chapter 9